Okay, hello, very warm welcome from the University of Innsbruck to all our Aurora partners. Uh, it's uh, 12 o'clock again on uh, Wednesday and um, uh, and uh, this is why we have the next part of our lecture series doing diversity in higher education in the Aurora European uh, Universities uh, Alliance, what we called our Aurora Brownback lecture series. So I hope you brought your own lunch uh, for today. Um, if you've been with us uh, last week on Wednesday, we had a, a special uh, um, class a little bit um, the side of our program, but at the same time very well fitting into the program. Uh, because if you've seen it, um, the foreign minister of uh, Luxembourg, Jean Asselborn, visited Innsbruck by chance to the time of our uh, lecture series. And so we included him uh, into our program and had a, a discussion with him on perspectives uh, for Europe, especially also um, uh, talking about um, diversity. Uh, issues. Unfortunately, this discussion was only in uh, German, so maybe you could follow us, maybe you couldn't. If you couldn't, we will uh, sum it up for you. Uh, and I think that will be uh, visible on the website later. Is that right, Silke? Yeah, um, exactly. And um, in fact, we touched um, on many uh, interesting um, aspects with uh, Jean Asselborn. Um, again, questions of diversity, what diversity means uh, for the European Union, what it means in education, uh, what it means on the university level, uh, what are broader perspectives um, for the European Union um, in terms of participation uh, and so on. Where does he see the European Union going uh, from here, especially after the uh, corona pandemic? and so on. And interestingly enough, we also touched um, uh, on the subject of uh, classism and um, social aspects of uh, diversity in higher education, but couldn't go uh, more deeply into it. So this is why we actually have the perfect uh, um, next topic coming up here with our two colleagues from the University of Innsbruck, Bernadette Müller-Kmidt and Vera Brandner. Welcome. And they will tell you something about the project they've done and Silke Meyer will introduce them in a minute. Uh, but uh, before we come to this main act um, of uh, today's session, uh, because there have been many questions on uh, um, how to complete, so to say, this lecture series here. If you are formally registered uh, student from one of the uh, Aurora universities, um, I can refer you once again to our um, website uh, where you find all necessary uh, informations. So for BA students, uh, we expect them to send us um, summary and reflection papers of three sessions of your own choice uh, from our lecture series here. And they should have approximately um, uh, around 1,200 words each. Uh, for uh, MA and PhD students, we expect you to send us summary and reflection papers of five sessions of your own choice. Uh, each around 2,000 words. So that's the requirement from our side uh, to complete the course. Again, you can choose uh, from all lectures that are part of the series here. As a BA student, you choose three of them. As an MA and PhD student, you choose five of them. Uh, and uh, you come up with a essay, so to say, uh, on these three or five sessions of 1,200 words for BA students and 2,000 words for 
MA and uh, PhD students. So that's our requirement. But again, you will also find that information on our website. Um, and with that, I hand it over to Silke, uh, who will introduce uh, our speakers today. Yes, thank you, Dirk, and thank you so much, Bernadette and Vera, for being with us today. Um, you already heard that um, we have, and when you remember the uh, introductory section about uh, intersectionality, uh, you remember that uh, diversity consists of so many different strands in life. We had um, we had the, the categories of, uh, of social class, we had uh, gender, we had uh, uh, location and background, ethnicity, we had nationality, uh, all sorts of uh, a big, big sort of a big um, umbrella, a big bunch of categories of difference. And um, when we had this question last uh, in the last session that about the socioeconomic background, that of course was pointed at social class. And uh, we didn't say much about it last week, but we're going to say a lot about it this week. And uh, I will tell you why uh, Vanadette and Vera are the perfect colleagues to answer this question. Let me start with Bernadette Müller-Kmet, who is the scientific director of the project Chill the Bases. She's been working as a university assistant in the field of quantitative methods and social sciences at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Innsbruck since, uh, I think, for a couple of years now, since 2015. She completed her doctorate at the Karl Franzens University of Graz in 2009 with a thesis on personal and social identity, focusing on how this concept can be operationalized. The doctorate was followed by two teaching and research stays at St. Augustine University of Tanzania. And in the context of this work, she dealt with sociological issues of education and development policy in higher education. That was followed by uh, work stations at the, again at the Karl Franzens University of Graz and at the University of Vienna. And uh, here in Innsbruck, she, uh, she follows her research interests in sociology of education and social inequality, identity research and migration research. Her colleague Vera Brandner, who is also part of the team of the project, studied international development at the University of Vienna with a focus on development, education and cultural difference. She completed her doctorate in the field of interdisciplinary method development at the Faculty of Sustainability Sciences at the Leuphana University in, in Lüneburg. She's also part of an NGO, it's called Ipsum, where she's designed and implemented projects in the field of education and peace work in Angola, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, and many other countries. Her research interests are developing participatory research methods in social sciences, as well as, again, the sociology of education and inequality. And you see that uh, their background is a, is, a, is a very perfect one for our session today, which, is dealt, which deals with the empowerment of non-traditional students. And you will explain to us what non-traditional students are. Thank you, Silke, and Dirk, for the nice introduction. Yeah, I'm really delighted to be here with you to um, share our insights that we gained uh, the last years while conducting the project Chill the Basis. Yeah, um, we will structure our presentation uh, as following. Uh, yeah, uh, we both carried out this project with the help of student assistants and a PhD candidate between 2007 and 2019. And let us start now where the story of the project began. Afterwards, we would like to summarize the most important project findings in relation to the question, how to empower non-traditional students. Maybe a too big goal for the short project time and for the short time of this session today. And finally, this leads us to a point where we need to reflect the project and discuss its limitations and obstacles. Yeah, here you see our project objectives. Uh, our project objectives uh, were uh, first 
to uh, the empowerment of non-traditional students in Tyrolean higher education institutions. Uh, I will soon uh, come back to the term non-traditional students. And that, that means that we uh, wanted to contribute to the realization of equality of opportunity for all students in the Tyrolean higher education area or in Tyrolean higher education institutions. Yeah, let me uh, tell you some uh, words about the funding framework. Um, yeah, maybe before I tell you that, I tell you something else. I can remember when I was asked to carry out uh, this project. Uh, actually, uh, I was not asked um, to carry out uh, a project on um, social inequalities in education. I was only asked to help um, a student with her PhD thesis on the topic of social inequalities in higher education institutions in uh, Tyrol. Uh, but uh, soon I recognized that the project was much bigger than expected. It was a project in the frame of the Hochschulraum Strukturmittel or the Higher Education Structural Funds provided by the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. And this funding framework had the idea to initiate and strengthen sustainable cooperation between universities in the field of teaching. In addition uh, to this, we got additional funding from the government of Tyrol and uh, income services of the participating higher education institutions. So who were the project partners that worked together with us to reach this uh, enthusiastic goals. Um, the University of Innsbruck uh, had the lead of this project. Um, two other uh, universities of applied sciences uh, joined the endeavor. It was the Fachhochschule Hofstein and the Management Center Innsbruck. Then also one private university, the UMIT, the Health and Life Science University, was member of the project team and the College of Teacher Education, the Pedagogische Hochschule Tirol. And besides these higher education institutions, also the Chamber of Labor, Arbeiterkammer Tirol, and uh, a project that is located at the University of Innsbruck, it's called Talente Scout Tirol. This is a one person or one man project, Reinhard uh, Starnberger. Um, uh, does this and he is trying to assist first generation students to access university and also uh, to counsel them during their studies uh, mainly at University of Innsbruck. Also um, he uh, advises also students from other higher education institutions in Tyrol that are the first ones in their family to study. Yeah, now I would like to give you an answer to the question, what are non-traditional students? The most uh, prominent and most quoted uh, definition of non-traditional students uh, is a definition that goes back to Schütze and Slovy, uh, now already um, 20 years ago when they formulated this definition. Um, I will read it. Thus, within the framework of the equality of opportunity discourse, the term tends to refer to socially or educationally disadvantaged sections of the population. For example, those from working class backgrounds, particular ethnic minority groups, immigrants, and in the past, frequently women. Um, while in the framework of the life, uh, cycle discourse, it tends to relate to older or adult students with a vocational training and work experience background, or other students with unconventional educational biographies. 
The term of non-traditional covers both different population and different models of participation. So uh, it means uh, non-traditional students refer to underrepresented uh, population groups at the university um, uh, in terms of different diversity characteristics like gender, age, uh, social uh, class, uh, ethnicity, migration background, and so on. But it also uh, refers on their life, uh, to their life cycles, uh, meaning to their way how they access higher education institutions. So this is a prominent, uh, frequently used definition. In our project, we defined non-traditional non students as followed. These are underrepresented student groups who, due to their social and regional backgrounds, face barriers when it comes to perceive and pursue educational paths other than those offered to them in their own communities. So this definition also uh, implies that um, children from academic backgrounds should be able um, to choose other ways than in their uh, families. For, for instance, to uh, select uh, vocational uh, educations, if they wish. But of course, this would need a, a societal, a larger societal a transformation because um, positions, occupational positions, are connected to different status uh, in society. And therefore, it's very rarely and very seldom that children from academic uh, backgrounds will decide for vocational um, educational um, pathways. And this is a topic that um, would go beyond the scope of our project. But what we want to say uh, that there should be a shift from asking how can everybody study to how can everybody do what suits him her best. But of course, uh, in our project, uh, we focused on non-traditional students mainly um, in terms of social background, of uh, social class. But that does not mean that um, not also other diversity characteristics other than uh, socioeconomic background, or if you want social class, played a crucial role in our um, project. Uh, I will illustrate this with a quote from an interview with a non-traditional student. Um, I want to uh, illustrate with this quote the intersectionality of uh, gender, age, and socioeconomic background of the student. And I will um, show you how this diversity uh, characteristics uh, multiply in her situation. Um, this student uh, said in the interview, uh, it was a female student, um, and she, she was at the end of finishing her uh, bachelor degree, and she um, uh, applied for a master's program. And she said, that puts me in a role dilemma. I will be 29 in October, and now I already have to think about it, because I definitely want to have children. And so I already have to think about it. How can I do that now? I have to finish the master's program in two years, and then I would like to work. In retrospect, I also think if I would have started three or four years earlier. And later on, um, she continues uh, saying what she should have done earlier. Uh, and what she wished that uh, should have been uh, some years earlier, to simply make the information more transparent, to solve the barrier so that someone who doesn't have the financial means can study 
or that there's a possibility. I didn't think about studying at 19 because that wasn't an issue for me because there was no money. And then you get into a whole dilemma when you are older. So you see from this quote uh, how social class background, um, gender and age corresponds. And um, we know from the literature that students from a low socioeconomic background are less likely uh, to continue their studies with a master's program. Um, we know uh, from uh, the literature uh, that students uh, coming from low socioeconomic uh, background, that they don't continue with their studies uh, immediately after secondary school, uh, but that they uh, often work uh, after school or that they um, make a second chance education, that they first choose a vocational education and only later on they um, do uh, a second chance education to get the university access, um, uh, entry access uh, certificate. So these students are older, so uh, we need to consider this intersectionality. Yeah, now let us ask to what extent is equality of, uh, of, of e is equality of opportunity realized? Here we need to differentiate between formal equality, equal opportunity and equal opportunity in terms of uh, statistical independence. Formal equality of opportunity means in principle, all educational pathways are open to all children, provided that they have the appropriate skills and are able to perform. Criteria unrelated to performance must not play a role, like uh, social class, socioeconomic background, uh, gender, migration background. Uh, yeah, in principle, formal equality of opportunity uh, is uh, fulfilled uh, in, in Austria. Every student uh, who uh, has this uh, university um, access uh, certificate in Austria, the Matura, in German, the Abitur, uh, can go and study at university. Um, yeah, the other form of equality of opportunity relates to the model of statistical independence. That means every school child should have the same starting chances in the education systems, regardless of his or her social background. Equality of opportunity would be achieved if differences between social groups were no longer reflected uh, in children's educational and career opportunities. For us, this would mean uh, that we should not have any run underrepresented groups at university. Uh, I will illustrate this to you on the example of the social background of the students in terms of the parents' educational uh, degree. Uh, in uh, Tyrol, the parent generation of the students uh, that are Tyrolean women and men between the age of 40 and 65 years. This is a very good indicator, you see. This is a fictive, uh, fictional um, parents generation has uh, obtained the following uh, educational uh, degrees. About 21% have only, uh, have only uh, received a compulsory school degree. Uh, that means that they went to school uh, for nine years. 37.7% of the parents uh, have vocational school and apprenticeship. This is our dual uh, vocational uh, education in Austria. Um, about um, nearly 15% have a school for intermediate um, vocational education. Uh, about 3.6% have a vocational master. 
about 10% have as highest degree a secondary uh, education, matura or abitur. Uh, that means um, university uh, access certificate. And uh, nearly 13% have a higher uh, education at the higher education institutions like a bachelor, a master's or a PhD degree. So now look at the, dis at the distribution of first year uh, students uh, related to uh, the edu educational degree of their parents. If equality of opportunities uh, is uh, fulfilled in terms of statistic independence, uh, the bars of the students should be exactly the same like the bars of uh, the, their parents or in the parents' generation. But what we see here is a different picture. Uh, we see that only few students, uh, less than 4%, um, with parents who have uh, the lowest educational level enter a uh, university. To remember you, in the parents' generation, this was one-fifth of the parents, more than one-fifth of the parents. Uh, we see the same picture with those um, students who have parents with vocational uh, school. Um, uh, uh, the difference is not very high between school for intermediate vocational education. We see that those students who have parents with a vocational master, um, actually uh, these uh, are those um, people with no um, un university degree, but are able um, in terms of uh, economic uh, and financial means, they are better off because they are employers. Um, yeah, uh, we also see that students who have parents with a secondary uh, education are clearly overrepresented, nearly one quarter of them. Um, one must uh, keep in mind that in the parents' generation, a secondary uh, education enabled them um, to get into higher um, occupational positions than this is the case today. And um, of course, um, students with parents coming, um, with coming from academic background, they are nearly 40% in the overall um, parents' generation, these are only 13%. So what we see here is that equality of opportunity uh, is not really uh, fulfilled. So why should we care about equality of opportunity? In a cynical way, uh, one could say equality of opportunity allows to justify inequalities. You know, we have so many inequalities in societies and it would be hard to bear <laughs> to think of these uh, inequalities each day and therefore it's um, and maybe uh, it helps to say these people at the short end of those inequalities at least could have been, had a fair chance of being in the better off group. Yeah, and now you can ask, is that enough? Um, many scholars, there are really many publications on this topic available, say, no, it's not enough. It unveils educational meritocracy as a myth for legitimizing social inequalities. But what should be the aim is equal opportunity for achieving social justice. Let me go one step back. Uh, and explain you the idea of education-based meritocracy, because I don't know if this is right um, spread uh, knowledge. Um, it's full of our uh, narratives in everyday life, in the media, at university, at school, everywhere, but it's good to think about the definition. Yeah, the basic ideas behind are that modern society, societies, they define themselves as meritocratic societies. Professional positions and life chances are to be distributed exclusively according to individual performance. Should be distributed exclusively according to individual performance. 
Diversity characteristics should have no influence on educational attainment and occupational positions. Only achievement serves as the exclusive selection criterion in modern societies and legitimizes social inequalities. This should be uh, the case. And the education system plays a crucial role of distributing occupational and societal uh, positions. This should be the case. But is this really true? This is just one example um, of our Bildungsstandard Überprüfung in Austria. We have the educational uh, standards and the educational uh, standards, they should guarantee the quality uh, of uh, school uh, education and they should um, be uh, their regular reviews um, of the competences of school children in the fourth grade and in the eighth grade and uh, they should provide uh, a feedback how how um, proper our education goals are reached. And these are the results from uh, the mass competences, competences of fourth grade students, primary school. And um, on average, the Tyrolean students, um, uh, primary students, reach 550 points. But of course, there are differences. Um, on average, um, the difference between girls and boys in um, reaching these points are 19 points. That means boys, uh, boys um, do uh, on average 19 points better when it comes to mass competences. The migration background counts for um, 58 points different. But when we control the migration background to um, a, uh, the parental educational degree, that means when we uh, compare children uh, with and without migration background in the same um, um, of parents with the same educational level, this difference uh, decreases to only 33 uh, points. That means, again, that we have here this intersectionality between uh, migration background and uh, social uh, class or socioeconomic backgrounds in terms of educational degree. So now, uh, when we look at the differences in mass competences between students who have parents with the lowest educational attainment, uh, compulsory uh, school with those with the highest educational attainment, university, the difference here is 110 points. So it's the highest uh, difference in competences. Uh, and I think this is an example uh, to show um, that equality of opportunity is not fulfilled in our uh, school system uh, because we see here um, huge differences between um, different societal groups. Yeah, but the belief in meritocracy is high. It's high among um, the population. Among uh, the children, uh, we asked uh, uh, school children uh, grade 8 and 9 in different schools in uh, the academic secondary school lower uh, cycle, but also in the middle school. Um, it is a secondary school uh, which often leads, leads um, later on to a, a vocational um, education pathway. Uh, yeah, and then we also um, uh, asked parents uh, of children, and you see here that those diversity characteristics uh, are ranked very high. We ask them the question, how important are the following points to be successful professionally in Austria? 
And here you see the answers of those who said it's essential and it's very important. And we see uh, the most important um, point rated uh, by uh, the parents and the children was being ambitious. More than 90% of the parents said that it's the most important thing to be ambitious for being uh, successful professionally in Austria. About 80% of the parents and the children said hard work. And um, a little bit uh, less frequently mentioned, but again, having a good education yourself, about 70% uh, or 75% said that this is essential or very important. On uh, the other end of this figure, you see, for instance, a person's skin color. It's rated as uh, only very few say that this is an important point. Or being born as a man or a woman. Only 15% say that this is important. Or coming from a wealthy family. Only 20% uh, percent say that this is crucial. Or having well-educated parents um, yourself. Only about one third of the respondents say that this is a crucial point for being successful professionally in Austria. So, what to do, where to start, what are the fields of the project, till the basis. Yeah, uh, soon we realized it's too late to start to empower non-traditional students at universities because only few of them uh, come to university. And we know from the literature that the dropout rate of non-traditional students from university uh, education is not higher than uh, of, uh, stu of traditional students. So it's important to work with school and families, but of course also um, to do something at the level of higher education institutions and to do something at higher education policy. Yeah, so what to do concretely? How to empower non-traditional students? From our project, uh, we want to stress three key findings, three key points. The first one is shift from problematizing non-traditional students to focus on a societal and cultural transformation process. We need exchange between uh, working class um, children and academic uh, children. Um, we need that um, the university is not only an elite uh, institution, that university is also an institution where working class culture finds its place. Another very important, crucial point, maybe the most important, uh, important uh, point, is awareness raising for all actors at all levels of the educational system. And to reach this, we need sustainable cooperation between all actors involved. Um, just some uh, quotes from non-traditional students to illustrate the importance of these points. Everybody should know that a, a problem, educational inequality, exists, not only for non-traditional students. This would be the first step of solving the problem. And now I illustrate you that this pro problem consciousness is not uh, given. You, you, uh, you can't observe it um, everywhere. Uh, we saw a lot of ignorance or um, we saw a lot of um, meritocratic um, uh, principles um, in all fields of the educational system. Here this is a quote from a secondary school director. He said, I don't understand what the issue of educational choice has to do with social background because blonde parents don't complain when they have blonde children either. This is really an extreme, extreme quote, but we have similar findings. This was the staff of a higher education institution 
at the beginning of the project and at the end of the project, but uh, one, must he did, um, one must say he did not participate in the process. He said, the topic of educational inequality in the media is already getting on my nerves because my wife could have gone to the mountain or to the gym instead of studying with the children. And at the end of the project, he said, I ask you to refrain from using the crude term educational heritage. This simply does not correspond to the fact because education does not fall to you. It is a high willingness to perform and strong efforts that lead to a higher educational degree. So these quotes should uh, uh, illustrate that we uh, need awareness raising, uh, a lot of awareness raising. Um, we don't need that much of information because from our uh, survey, we know that uh, about 90, between 85 and 90 percent of the school students, uh, they said that they are uh, rather good or very good informed about the options after uh, graduating from school. But it's, it's awareness raising on another level we need. And this is illustrated by the following quote. He was a non-traditional student and he said, uh, he summarized this point very good, I think. The biggest hurdle was in my head. That was always. I felt that it, university, was too high for me. And I didn't fit there, and I didn't belong there. To a very small extent, I think that's true, as I mentioned earlier. I was born into it, whereas that too, just because the parents go and work, and then you also go to work. In Austria, thank God, it's relatively well possible to go to a gymnasium, for example, and immediately take the matura, the university entrance certificate, but, that's, but that still only happens in very, very rare cases. Born into it precisely because of the same effect that the hurdle is there in the head and that the parents don't encourage you to do it. Uh, so these students uh, brings it to the point how important awareness raising is and there it does not uh, it's not enough to provide them with information material, you need to work them. And how uh, we worked with them, um, Vera will tell you. So now I hand over to Vera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I also, am I also a presenter? Can I move the... And I yeah, should be a presenter. You see? Ah, yeah, 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 it works. Thank you very much, Bernadette. So our project was on the one hand, a classic, classic investigation on what are our challenges in Austria and Tyrol and higher education area with um, equal opportunity in education. And we can analyze and we can compare and we can collect data and we see, yeah, we have a problem. It's maybe not obvious for everybody and unfortunately we realize that it's not obvious for most of the people <laughs> um, and that is why we had to think, okay, we need to get out of, the ivor of, of our ivory tower comparing, analyzing, collecting data. We need to engage with people. We really need to work and engage with those people who are at stake. So, um, as Bernadette was explaining before, we had three main project fields and one of our fields was uh, working with schools and families, with kids at schools, teachers and parents. Um, to get you some insight to what we did, I will, will tell you a little bit. It's not into detail, I will tell you a little bit about the processes and the methods in order to let you know what kind of work we implemented or we did uh, for awareness raising and consciousness building beside our analysis and data collections. So it was actually a research-based learning process. Our research interest and our learning interest at the schools was 
What experiences, wishes and ideas do children and their guardians have on the subject of education? Furthermore, to what extent is there a connection between social and regional origin and the respective understanding of education? Furthermore, and maybe most importantly, as Bernadette also uh, mentioned before, what does a child, a child need in order to follow the educational path that best suits him or her? And not to ask, how can we bring everybody to university? So that's not the <laughs> focus. Our learning interest in this uh, research-based learning project was raising awareness and consciousness about education and educational choices. So you see, in this combination that we had a research interest and a learning interest, it was also a normative goal. So let's say, and uh, let's also make transparent, it's a project where we follow a normative goal uh, that is um, to, to foster uh, cultural and societal transformation towards more social justice. Um, the research-based learning at schools was different uh, on different levels. In the main project was a participative project with third grade students. We uh, led group discussions with their parents and we also made a quantitative survey with all parents of the participating primary schools. And furthermore, we uh, led qualitative interviews with the teachers who accompanied the process with the kids. So the school teachers, the primary school teachers of the kids who were uh, with us all the time over a semester. We, we worked with in, in five schools with uh, each class, uh, each group of kids was working with us for a semester. And in this time working with the kids, the teachers were not um, uh, active. They were just there and observing. And so we could uh, hold the, those uh, interviews with them on the process afterwards, on the transformation process of the kids actually. Just to give you an insight what we did, we worked a lot with photography, other creative um, methods and also drama pedagogy. And we were asking a lot and exploring together with the kids the following questions. Who are your role models? Where do you like to learn? What do you want to become? And in the focus, in the center of all those questions was again and again the question, what is education? What does it mean to you? First, we thought it would not work with third grade kids to ask this complex question of what is education, but we found out that it works quite well. And this was also uh, showing our um, um, evaluation with the teachers later on, you will see. So um, a few pictures in order to get an idea what we did. So the kids got cameras and they got the invitation to to find answers to the to the questions that I mentioned just um, in their everyday life, in their social uh, surrounding. So they went out for two weeks to work on the separate um, uh, questions. So each question was worked on for two weeks over a semester. Um, they were also journaling all the time and um, noting their um, main findings in journals. And in between, when we had workshops, it was five workshops throughout the semester, we again and again made interview um, group interviews with the kids where they sat together, closed their eyes, uh, and were thinking about the question of what does education mean to me? And they gave their answers in this interview, uh, in these group interviews. And it was so interesting to see how at the beginning of the semester, when we started to work with them and asking them the first time, what is education? Their scope, their range of answers was very um, uh, narrow. It was not a lot. It was such an interview uh, um, durated like five minutes. And in the end of the process, they were talking about education for an hour. So it really changed. And we, we repeated it each time in between the, the different methods. And they, they were widening their uh, ideas what education could be. And in the end, it was not just going to school, but also, for example, friendship or caring for other people or uh, uh, exploring things and so on. So. A teacher who accompanied the process was uh, describing it as such. It was somehow quite interesting for me how the children played with the notion of education and ultimately self-reflection -ref takes place. 
Is education now really just what we understand by classical education? You go to some institution, get taught there, and that is education? Or is education really more expansive and multi-layered? The kids were not just taking their pictures, they were also organizing, structuring and um, deciding and selecting their pictures and then again putting them together in their journals and most importantly they were also exchanging each other on their findings and on their pictures. Through picture dialogues they were uh, expressing themselves, what they found, what they think, what they wish and what they understand uh, what education could be. Their idea of education, another teacher quoted, has become completely different. Before, for the kids, it was really education is going to school. And now education is really everything. And you can tell that it's no longer so narrow-minded. You really notice that the thoughts became free. Um, it was not just thinking and reflecting work and structural work. It was also very important that we included um, uh, drama pedagogy and my colleague Monika Lingitz uh, was here very important because she's a very great uh, drama pedagogist and we connected our different methods in the in the groups and in the setting uh, so the kids could through engaging with the whole bodies and senses better express themselves so this was very very important also in the process for awareness raising and again they were talking to each other and organizing their findings and important they were also um, including their parents and presenting them what they found and what they wish and what they are so parents could actually interact not just in the group discussions that we led with them but also in the exhibitions the kids made for their parents it's amazing when i look at the photos like this another teacher said that something also moved with the parents they engaged with their kids and went out with them for taking pictures. They wouldn't have done that otherwise. So there has been a lot of positive de development simply because the parents were also involved. And you can see that even parents who maybe do not um, do so much have suddenly joined in. So that is somehow a little bit inside of the work with the kids and the teachers and the parents. Um, we would like to go on with it, but unfortunately the project stopped and uh, this would be very uh, important to have in, in long-lasting work with the teachers. Also, that was a an, an result in the evaluation with the teachers that this process could go through the whole time of primary school from first grade to fourth grade. Such a kind of awareness raising could be very useful. Um, I will also give you a little bit of insight into the other level where we worked, the higher education institutions. Here we led a participative project with staff members of higher education institutions. A few, uh, just one, two actually um, members of the management um, of the management of the higher education institutions took part sometimes, but mainly it was um, staff members from uh, Verwaltung and, sorry, <laughs> uh, was administrative staff, units. Admin, uh, from the administrative units. Okay, so what did we do here? We had a research and learning interest again. Uh, the research interest was what activities for more equal opportunity in higher education exist? To find out about the state of the art. How do actors in Tyrolean higher education perceive their actions and engagement concerning equal opportunity in higher education? And how could the institutions work together in order to achieve more equal opportunity, which is actually an overall uh, um, goal from the, from the um, fundings. Our learning interest was, again, raising awareness and consciousness about equal opportunity in higher education institutions. So, 
this is an overview to the process. It just gets you some idea. We cannot go into detail because it was very um, complex, actually. Uh, we decided uh, to go for scenario techniques with the staff members of the higher education institutions. This is a method coming from future uh, um, studies where the participants together develop scenarios that are to be reached in some time, <laughs> after some time. So what did we do there? We had a first phase uh, where we determined the research field and uh, made an actors analysis uh, with in investigation on the state of the art, with analysis of secondary data, with interviews with experts, website analysis, feedback sessions with the partner institutions on what we found about them and on them. Uh, second, in the second phase, we developed scenarios with them. First, extreme poll scenarios, and then institutional wish scenarios. So scenarios that the institutions are desiring for their future and for the future of the um, educational area, the higher education area in Tyrol. In the third phase, we uh, came to the strategy development where we were creating collective wish scenarios. We were developing activity fields, identifying further actors, and we were also identifying responsibilities and cooperation, cooperation fields. The fourth phase is still ongoing, actually, <laughs> even though the, the project ended in 2019, but yeah, officially, actually it should go on. <laughs> um, it's the phase where we should put into practice what we jointly developed in these processes with the kids, with the students, with the, high, uh, with the staff from higher education, our strategy that we developed in the phases before. Um, we had so far presentation at the rector's team at the University of Innsbruck, and we had also a presentation at the Tyrolean Conference of Higher Education and suggested our strategy and our results. Um, but unfortunately, it was not taken into consideration yet in order to uh, implement uh, the strategy that was developed. So to let you feel a little bit more of the scenario process, um, how, how did we come to these scenarios for future? We put two dimensions. The one dimension is the access to higher education. You see on the left side, the access to higher education and extreme poll just for the rich and or the talented. And on the right side, we have the extreme poll of access to higher education for all. So we could decide on this range. And on the vertical dimension, we have um, the perception of education in the institution. So on the extreme poll uh, up, we have education for self fulfillment fulfillment, like the humanistic ideals of education. And down there we have education for utilization on the labor market. So we invited the groups, uh, the, we invited the participants to work out those four um, extreme scenarios together. And to work on these edges. So one group worked on the combination of access to higher education and education for self-fulfillment. Another group worked on the combination of education for self-fulfillment and access to higher education for all. The third one was the combination of access to higher education just for the rich and the talented and education for utilization on the labor market. And the fourth scenario was um, the education for utilization of the labor market and the access to higher education for all. So that were the extreme scenarios, just to, to get an idea. And based on those extreme scenarios, the, we worked out different storylines and titles and um, participants also positioned their own institutions in these fields, in these extreme scenarios. And the next step was not just to do that for their own institution, but to create out of these extreme scenarios together a wish scenario across 
the universities and uh, institutions of higher education in order not just to stick with the own wishes for the own institution in order to uh, perform well, but to uh, cooperate and work together on the higher goal of social justice. So um, results out of this process are as follows. Um, we were implementing support measures for non-traditional students during the project period. Uh, we, we created a cross-university future scenario, a wish scenario for the development of the Tyrolean higher education area with, the regard, with regard to equal opportunities for all. And we developed a strategy paper for the realization of the desired scenario in the Tyrolean higher education area. It's a concept proposal to the, in the end, to the Tyrolean Higher Education Conference. But as we experience, we need to look for further options to present or to suggest uh, in order to get it implemented. Um, the strategy is actually not too complicated. <laughs> it looks very simple in the end. It was a very complicated um, process to find consensus on, consensus on the strategy, but in the end it's easy. We need a coordination office for more equality of opportunities in Tyrol and higher education. So um, a place where all the uh, institutions can get come together and the person who is also uh, organizing the cooperation. We need an advisory board for more equal opportunities in, in Tyrol and higher education. And we need working groups to implement <laughs> the measures and activities and to work in the activity fields um, that are the following. So we identified and have consensus about the following uh, activity fields throughout all the participating institutions, inter-institutional anchoring and networking, awareness raising and sensitization, information and advice, which is not so uh, such a priority in comparison to awareness raising, mentoring and support, um, working on university access options, study organization and cu curriculum, acquisition of competencies and monitoring and scientific support. Finally, <laughs> I want to get you also some insight into our limitations and obstacles because as Bernadette mentioned before yeah uh, <laughs> we wanted a lot and we still want a lot <laughs> we, we are really still uh, wishing for a social justice in this um, field but we we uh, faced a lot of limitations actually first of all the process and the project was top down conceptualized um, we had almost no participation of the decision makers, let's say the uh, management of the higher, higher education institutions. Um, and it's easy to understand, actually, if you do not, if it's not your baby, you do not engage. <laughs> that is what we ca somehow can uh, summarize. Uh, the low priority and the commitment to discuss and implement the future, future strategies were were an, an obstacle for us, of course, for phase four, for um, the um, transfer, the scenario transfer. Um, an obstacle was also the project logic. <laughs> and actually, we are all living this project logic. So um, I'm always working in projects at university, and this is, has an, a beginning and an end. And um, if you want to install sustainable corporations and install a sustainable structures, that were actually the aim of the Hochschulraumstrukturmittel Hochschul uh, funding, the higher education structural funds, it's somehow a contradiction because we did, I guess, our best to <laughs> develop the strategies and to work with the people and also to do our research. But if this is not um, possible to um, install after a project ended, it's really hard to achieve real uh, societal and tran uh, cultural transformation. Further limitations are that, yeah, in our project team, to be honest, we have an initial assumption that creating social justice in higher education institutions is important to everybody. But uh, it was our assumption and our research 
um, made clear that this is not the case. Um, yeah, and the last um, obstacle, uh, my colleague Bernadette did already uh, outline it very clearly. We have a widespread conviction of educational meritocracy in, through, among all actors and all levels involved. And there is a slogan or a motto that, that kids le learn at kindergarten or maybe before at, at, at uh, primary school, we, we, <laughs> we um, have seen a lot of this incorpor incorporated slogan. And then later on again, the teachers have it incorporated. And also later again, the, the lecturers and professors and of course management level at universities have it incorporated. This slogan of you can if you only want. And what we miss, really miss, at that point is to ask um, who is in the position to want, who is in the position to develop a strong will to go a path that is not um, recommended in your own community or in your own social background. So what is the circumstances that a person has to be in in order to develop that will and this wanting? And with this question, we, I, I want to close my um, my lecture, and I'm I want to invite you for discussion. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, thank you so much to to both of you. Um, that uh, um, it's really interesting to follow your uh, your reasoning and to follow your numbers and uh, and, and the, also the experiences you made during the uh, the process. I mean, it, it kind of starts on the title, isn't it? I mean, empowerment is not to be understood to really um, change the individual so that they can want, <laughs> but to change, basically to change society, to have us from what's needed from a structural point of view. What do the institutions um, need? And I mean, you made a, a, a quite a few suggestions. And I, I really uh, also, I mean, took notice that um, you know what we don't need is um, an administrative unit for um, non-traditional students in first generation students at the universities because basically i mean once once they got there they will uh, they might need some extra views but uh, that's not the real problem you need to go into the schools this is where you need to sort of change society so university is not the level but you need to start before and then follow through and then follow through on all different stages um, should we just ask Christian um, if there are any uh, comments yet? Uh, if not, I'm sure Dirk has a few and I also have a few. I think there are no comments yet in the chat. Right? Okay, so I will give you uh, time to type. Right. But also, thank you so much from my side. It was really interesting. Um, and I, I mean, there are so many points we could talk about. Um, uh, I think it, in the beginning it was very interesting, you know, talking about this group of non-traditional students that it's in itself very diverse. I mean, talking about mm -hmm. intersectionality, right? So it's not a. So if you hear and 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 you know, with Aselborn last week we talked about this social dimension and classism, and um, but when we use this term non-traditional students, it's actually obvious it's a it's a very diverse group in itself, right? It's not a uh, so it's it, there's no one way to be non-traditional um, at the university. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. So how you know how that affects your study because uh, because you address actually very different groups. If, also, if you talk about diversity, right? I mean, they would come up at different parts of the spectrum of diversity, um, but they all fall together in this. Uh, term of uh, non-traditional students and uh, the same might be true for the higher education institutions right if we talk about Tyrol it's uh, I mean we have a we have a classical university so to say right like the University of Innsbruck which was for for many many years and centuries the only higher education institution in in Tyrol but now over the last 20 years it's other forms come up right like this um uh, fachhochschulen i'm not sure if we can only even translate that into uh 
uh, into other languages or if it exists in other languages. So, um, um, what's actually Polit Polytechnics. Yeah, Polytechnic. right. In yeah, right. Uh, so, so how does, I mean, so, again, very diverse insti institutions, right, that come together in the field of higher education and you could actually see that at your um, this uh, the, with the four fields because the University of Innsbruck was uh, uh, far up on the on the right um, side and uh, the others were more in the middle so there's also a difference between these different institutions also a diversity on the institutional level so so I'm just interested if you can say a little bit more about this this the, this di diversities on both sides different institutions, different groups coming together as non-traditional. Okay, yeah, I, I try to answer your question, uh, starting with the students. Uh, you are right, the vast majority of the students are in a sense um, non-traditional. Um, but uh, I think uh, there are differences. Uh, between them. And it's very important and what we wanted to stress within our project that there are some characteristics, some diversity characteristics that are invisible, like uh, social class, but have a huge impact. And it's often uh, argued we don't, we do not um, want to um, to use uh, the term like uh, social class or like first in um, family students or first in generation students because this is somehow um, a discrimination. Uh, this has the danger of discriminating them and stereotyping them. But I think with other uh, obvious uh, diversity markers, we do not have uh, this problem. For instance, migration uh, background or uh, students with uh, disabilities or, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's important that we do not forget about these invisible um, diversity markers that have a large impact uh, on um, the student, on their educational uh, choices, and on uh, life um, at u university. For instance, um, I do not have the number of completely in mind, but I know that vast the majority of the students are, are working besides their studies in Austria, about 70%, I think. But uh, we know from the um, social student survey, uh, Studierenden Sozialerhebung, uh, that is conducted in Austria, I think, every uh, four years. We know that uh, students from low uh, socioeconomic background, they um, work, um, they do work that does not, that has nothing to do with their studies. Uh, for instance, they work as sellers, uh, uh, they do uh, simple uh, tasks which are not, which will not help them when they write their CV. Yeah? And students from uh, higher socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, they work in positions that are closely related to their studies and they have an advantage after completing their studies, um, having done these jobs because they are related to their studies. So, yeah, so this is my answer to the, to the students and my answer to the institutions. Yeah, uh, it's right, the um, institutions are very uh, diverse. They are partly uh, also diverse uh, in uh, being attractive for different uh, groups of students. Um, uh, usually you say uh, this Fachhochschulen or this uh, University of Applied Science, um, they attract more likely um, students with low so socioeconomic backgrounds because uh, then um, these students, they expect, and this also um, uh, corresponds with reality, that after completing their studies from a Fachhochschule, from a University of Applied Science, they get easier a job, and also uh, the duration of their studies, uh, they, it, this is more predictable. Because when you study at a Fachhochschule, uh, you will have your bachelor degree within uh, uh, three years. But if you study at university, yeah, this is uh, somehow um, not sure. 
But what we found out for the Tyrolean higher education area, this is, is not, um, this does not completely correspond. For instance, the management uh, center Innsbruck, it's also a university of applied science, but this uh, attracts uh, students with quite a high uh, socioeconomic uh, status. But this uh, could also have been at, at an advantage within the project that different higher education institutions attract different groups of students uh, for working together for empowering um, students with low socioeconomic uh, background to a higher uh, education. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe I just yeah. wanted to add, <clears throat> actually, we don't have this problem of diversity. Diversity is actually great. It's just a problem, as we, we pointed out, if diversity um, leads to injustice. And if one group that has a certain kind of uh, a certain characteristics and is diverse to others uses that diversity in order to have privileges that others do not have, and mm. that's actually the, right. the problem. Yeah. I mean, um, anyhow, welcome. <laughs> we'll take a few questions from the chat, and I think the first one uh, fits in uh, quite quite nicely. I mean, we have because um, I mean, we, of course, when we ask what can non-traditional students bring to the table, then we have a, a variety of offers. Um, but how unfortunately society doesn't doesn't always see it like this. And then I'm going to uh, read out the first question. Just wondering, tackling educational meritocracy by means of creating awareness on this is that enough? If I look at our current society, everything is based on achievement and aiming for the highest. If you only want it yourself, is educational meritocracy not a very small section of a larger problem in society? And um, I think we can all agree. I mean, I don't know if you uh, want to share your, your thoughts on this, but um, of, of course, um, you know, you can, you have your, um, you have your project partners, you have uh, the people you work with, you have the schools, you have the teachers, but, um, and, and that's trying to act as a multiplier within society. But this sits, of course, very firmly within a very deeply problematic part uh, of, part of how social thinking works. Yeah, for answering this question, I would like to go to our very last slide. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite quotes by Basil Bernstein, education cannot uh, compensate for society. And therefore also we said um, we need a cultural and societal transformation process. But that's <laughs> very, yeah, that's a very fitting quote. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. <laughs> well, it's not possible to do this within a quote. Yeah. It is part of it, there, and it's a it's a long process. Um, I'm going to take the the second question. Um, uh, what needs to be done, in your opinion, to make the so-called decision makers listen? To get them emotionally attached to the topic would be my <laughs> spontaneous answer. Uh, yeah, to um, uh, that they are. Um, part of the process from the beginning on. No. I mean, I think you described that the, the project you did in the school that uh, the teachers, you got everybody on, on board. I mean, everybody, maybe they were skeptical at the beginning, but once you work with them, the teachers were there, the parents were there, and you know, the next step would be decision makers to actually get them in schools and see how, um, how, how students work and how they change their perception of education. Yeah, so that's the main main point to to create attachment and um, to really ask the people and listen to them. <laughs> I think that's not common uh, in such processes. But uh, what what worked very well in the process with the kids is that they were asked for their opinions and for their explorations, and they were listened to. And then their parents listened to them, and their teachers listened to them, and then they also exchanged with each other and they were uh, giving uh, attention to each other. So this was, yeah, why not do that with adults? 
<laughs> why are we not in such processes when we are working in these institutions? So that's why we also designed the participative process for the mm -hmm. um, staff members of the higher institutions. And we also involved a little bit of drama pedagogy, not too much, not to stress it too much because it's not common in such settings. But we also need this attachment with the whole, sen wow. with all our senses and also our experiences because there might be a lot of people who have different experiences in their biography. So biographical work and exchange on that biographical stories uh, would also help in order to engage and attach and see, wow, you, you did go this path, I went that path. So there are a lot of pathways, not just one. Mm -hmm. But to engage the management level is so hard because there is always a lack of time. And everybody says there is no time, but actually it's a lack of prioritizing um, because time we can we can find time for things that we prioritize. And what we experienced when we presented our our um, results in uh, at the management levels, uh, we just experienced that there is not the will to put priority on the social dimension and on the, um, on the aim of uh, more uh, equal opportunity for all. The, it, there is no priority on it. It's not a lack of time. It, this is just in front the, 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the, the a pretense. The, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shall we take another question? From yes. Uh, uh, There's a third one. Um, could you explain again why you've chosen this specific definition of non-traditional students? offered by their own communities. How did you define those communities besides family and parents? So I uh, went back to the slides. Um, yeah, it was a long process because first we studied how our project partners uh, define non-traditional students. Uh, we ourselves, um, we did not uh, choose the term non-traditional students. This term uh, was put in the project application and we were not part of uh, writing the project application. So somehow we needed to work with this um, term. And for um, our partner institutions, um, non-traditional students they had different groups in mind. For instance, the teacher uh, college for them, uh, it were the male students. For University of Innsbruck, uh, it um, was the, it were the um, first generation students. Um, for um, um, the universities of applied sciences, it were the students who uh, had um, uh, occupational experiences before. So there we had different uh, definition. Uh, yeah, and then uh, we were convinced of this, that a shift is necessary from um, asking how can everybody study to how can everybody do what suits him her best. And what is hindering the students to um, fulfill this uh, are uh, their uh, communities and their values, uh, their way of thinking, their mindsets they are getting in their communities. And of course, first of all, their community of a child is the family, the parents, but it's the wider community. It's the milieu, uh, the social class uh, in where they are born and in where they are raised up. Maybe Vera, you want to add something? No, just to say that the, the, the perception of the different institutions on the definition of uh, non-traditional students was as diverse as their standing in the field of education. And it's mm -hmm. of, of course because they have some customers, let's say, to, <laughs> to, uh, to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's somehow where they are also defined uh, non-traditional students because for some institutions it's a group of customers that they can gain. Can I ask um, a question if there, there aren't any others at the moment? Um, 
I mean, there's been a lot of talk that Corona has kind of shaken up the educational scene, you know, with the growing numbers in homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what do you think would effect that will have? Yeah, one of the may, may I ask back? Sorry, mm -hmm. um, what do you mean? Um, how how the situation of homeschooling affects the situation of um, inequality in opportunities, or the situation of non-traditional students? Or uh, I, I didn't. Um, no, I think um, the, the the question um, will people find a, a path that is not uh, kind of pre uh, pre arranged for them? I mean. Um, being more under the influence of their own uh, in, within their own sort of their own family, that the, the milieu, the smaller uh, entities in that. Um, at, to me, it seems that this would be kind of counter counterproductive. Canada, do you want? Yeah, um, uh, what we already know uh, from studies is that the. Um, differences, for instance, in competences um, uh, because of homeschooling are getting larger and larger. Uh, those from high socioeconomic uh, status, uh, those uh, children, they uh, even profit uh, from it and uh, those children from low socioeconomic um, backgrounds, they fall uh, behind. And that's uh, for sure, that's now a, a huge uh, problem um our uh, society needs uh, to deal because these uh, children uh, they really they now um yeah they they um they have a, a lack in their competences uh but um i think that's that's not the uh, the most um important uh, problem uh, connected uh, to this issue i think it depends how the situation uh, develops but uh, I think that inequalities also uh, increases with digitalization uh, of uh, education. Uh, and this is um, the, uh, the case uh, because of, uh, of, of Corona. For instance, we know from uh, studies, also from our own studies, that um, digitalization um, on the one uh, side, uh, you need to have the equipment and I recognize even uh, with my own students that the equipment often is not uh, sufficient. So how can the equipment of school uh, children can be sufficient? Um, yeah, and I think uh, and we know this from uh, studies from uh, Australia um, that uh, it's not good to teach um, uh, primary uh, school children uh, with digital uh, methods. Uh, you know, we know this from uh, neuroscience uh, from uh, neuroscience and biological um, uh, findings that the relation between the teacher and the child uh, is the most uh, important uh, factor in, in learning. And this we cannot compensate um, with, um, uh, with, with, with technologies. So uh, I think here uh, it, it's a wild uh, field of, of problems that um, arise. And what I wanted to say is that um, children of higher socioeconomic status, they uh, also tend to use the internet, for instance, um, for uh, really for, for learning, for uh, preparing uh, presentations, for doing assignments and, and so on, or for um, uh, informing themselves for uh, um, educational pathways. And children for, from lower socioeconomic uh, status, uh, they tend to, do, uh, to use the internet for different uh, things, but not for things that are related to their educational pathways and bring them further. So here we have this digital divide. Um, yeah. And just in addition to that, the bubble building that um, gives, uh, it brings us to a more severe social segregation that you are not attached to the other pathway. You are not feeling and exchanging with the other because the bubbles, they are um, actually um, somehow more, um, closed and people cannot really interact and exchange their experiences. That leads us back to the question before that we need attachment 
actually. Okay, we are already a little bit over time, but uh, thank you so much for a very interesting talk and uh, uh, and also our audience for the questions and uh, for the discussion. Um, so um, we see you next week, Wednesday, November third, um, and we are moving uh, to Spain this time. Uh, Professor Barbara Bilia from the Universitat Rovira e Virgili from Tarragona um, will join us and will talk about the need for a feminist intersectional approach to tackle sexual and gender related violence within higher education institutions. Um, Silke, last word from your side. Okay. So, see you next week. Okay, see you next week and I hope we could answer all your questions, also all the technical questions um, on the requirements here. So have a great day. Thank you, Bernadette and Vera. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.